Okay, I want to welcome everybody back and uh, really look forward to uh, this uh, next about 20 minutes uh, of, of uh, opportunity to have listened to from some of our students. We've got three students uh, that are be presenting today, uh, Rachel Hall, Brooklyn Maynard, and uh, Maggie Mullen. Uh, and they are all part of a uh, undergraduate research class that has been uh, provided by, mentored by uh, Razi Ahmed, uh, who's a, a faculty member at the University of Kansas. Rachel Hall will be uh, leading us off today. Um, and each one of our students are going to be talking about Iran and their projection of soft power. Um, and, uh, the per and that is the focus of this class, uh, soft power and Iran. And Rachel is going to uh, do that from the perspective of Russia. Rachel is a junior from uh, Lenexa, Kansas. Uh, her major is Global and International Studies. And uh, much like uh, the other two students, she has a goal of uh, working possibly in the uh, US intelligence community. So great opportunity uh, to get your name out there, Rachel. Uh, and you also have an interest uh, in possibly uh, serving in the Foreign Service as well. Following Rachel will be Brooklyn Maynard. Uh, uh, Brooklyn is a junior from Harrisonville, Missouri. Uh, she has a double major, both political science and, again, global international studies. And Brooklyn also has an interest in the U.S. intelligence community, specifically with the State, Bureau, uh, State Department's uh, um, uh, 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 nat uh, <clears throat> National uh, Institute of National Research. Um, and she's going to be uh, focusing on RAN and the Stans. Uh, and finally, uh, Maggie Mullen. Uh, Maggie is a senior um, from Omaha, Nebraska, and her major is in behavioral and neuroscience. Um, she is a, uh, also, again, working, uh, interested in working in the uh, U.S. intelligence community or possibly law school, and she'll be focusing on Iran and uh, Hezbollah. So with that as an uh, introduction, uh, Rachel, I uh, turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen to get the presentation. Real quick. Okay, so um, my research is entitled The United States Hard Power Impact on Iranian Russian Soft Power Relations. The research question being addressed deals with the position of the Trump administration's foreign policy in regards to Iran. The text analysis qualitative research will inquire into the short and long term effects of pulling out of the JCPOA while also raising hard power influence on Iran. It is then intended to delve into how these actions affected the relationship between Russia and Iran. The basis of my research consists of references to Joseph Nye's international relations theory regarding power. The references to hard power in this research consist of economic coercion in the form of economic sanctions. However, economic assistance through trade and humanitarian aid is referred to as a soft power influence within the research because it lacks force. According to Nye, it persuades and influences based on mutual appeal. The relations between the United States and Iran are very tedious currently because of the United States' fear of Iranian weaponization of nuclear materials, because of the sphere of the Obama administration entered into a nuclear deal with Iran, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or the JCPOA. It ensured that Iran would not make a nuclear weapon by implementing regular unbiased inspections. The JCPOA also stipulated that the members of the Security Council decrease sanctions if Iran adheres to its side of the agreement. However, the President Trump determined that the threat from Iran was too heavy and in 2018 withdrew the United States from the JCPOA. This consequently led to a development of full four sanctions on Iran. However, scholars and NGOs have reviewed this, how sanctions impact a country and determined that they will really just devastate the average citizens while having little to no impact on top tier officials. This is mainly due to the fact that in regimes like Iran, the government and upper level officials already control the economy. This means that the rest of the country is completely economically destroyed. Several NGOs, including the Human Rights Watch, have investigated what part of the country is most impacted by such severe sanctions, and they come to the conclusion that due to the sanctions and secondary sanctions the U.S. is having on Iran, most Iran Iranians are unable to get the necessary medicines they need, and it leads to a medical supply shortage. 
Russia has wanted and needed to cultivate its relationship in terms of soft power in order to stay relevant in comparison to the other hegemonic um, powers dominating currently. Russia has been using hard power allyship tactics with Iran, particularly in the context of the Syrian civil war, but has struggled to compete on the same level of control throughout soft power. When the Trump administration pulled out of the JCPOA and started sanctioning Iran abruptly, Moscow saw an opportunity to develop its own leverage within the country. Iranian, or Iran pushes the support from Russia onto the Iranian public within the country, uh, showcasing how generous Russia is in the face of the quote, American economic terrorism, unquote. This diplomatic show of support through meetings with Iranian uh, officials and going head to head with the US um, is in international institutions is a form of soft power. The Iranians now feel supported through Russia, through hard powers um, such as arms, but also soft powers like public support. Since the Trump administration's withdrawal from the JCPOA, Iranian in trade has skyrocketed um, by over $2 billion. Um, in 2020, Russian exports were up 31% to Iran. Russia is also developing a major trade port in Iran, implying long-term economic investment. Many suggest that Russia saw the economic uh, turmoil that the United States put Iran through with extensive hard power influence and decided to extend their assistance. Another huge aspect of Russian soft power influence within Iran is their humanitarian aid. Russia has levered COVID-19 to their advantage by strategically helping Iran with medical assistance. They've donated ventilators, equipment, masks, and even vaccines. In conclusion, sanctions referred to as hard powers in my research by the United States on Iran have led to depletion in medical supplies and consequently the suffering of common people. It has also led to an extreme economic recession with little help. Russia has sought to emerge as a savior by supplying medicines, medical equipment, and other economic aids. They've also enhanced their image of a strong Iranian ally by ex um, ex executing trade deals and being a vocal advocate on Iranian rights on the international stage. In summary, there appears to be a direct link between the hostile American-Iranian relations and Russia's attempts to enhance its soft power in Iran. And that's it, if anybody has any questions. I will look and see right now. I don't see anything right now. That I thought Rachel does a great job. I do have, uh, I'll ask one. Um, from your perspective, do you think that uh, Russia is actually in this for um, you know, their own uh, you know, benefit or do you believe that it's to check the United States? Do they have larger um, designs in the region? In my opinion, I think it's um, they have big designs within the Middle East. I believe that they want to um, become allies with Iran in order to dominate that region. And they believe that Iran is their best chance of doing that, um, especially in the context of the Syrian war and against Israel and the United States. I also believe that they do just want to um, kind of take the hegemonic power from the United States as much as possible, especially within that region. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. I did a, a wonderful job there. Uh, Brooklyn, we'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to you now. Thank you. Um, my name is Brooklyn Maynard, and the project I am presenting is titled Mitigating Western Pressures Through Unexpected Eastern Allies, Understanding Iran's Utilization of Soft Power in Central Asia. Iran is strengthening its diplomatic relations in the five Central Asian states, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. I examine this through a qualitative comparative analysis of Iranian foreign policy with the individual countries from the period of 2018 to April of this year. Findings of the study indicate a correlation between Iran's increased interactions with the Stans and the United States withdrawal from the JCPOA. Additionally, results also highlighted a causal linkage between Iran's increased collaboration with China, specifically through the Belt and Road Initiative, and the Central Asian Strait's increased reciprocity to building socioeconomic relations with Iran. This is because Central Asia and Iran both have historical significance on the Silk Road. 
The receptiveness by the Central Asian states is a recent development as US sanctions on Iran have historically limited the Stan's willingness to associate with the Islamic Republic. These advances prompt a more extensive discussion about the continued use of economic sanctions on Iran as a reputational tool of punishment in the international sphere, meaning that the negative stigma associated with sanctions is starting to no longer hinder countries from doing business with Iran. Iran's foreign policy in Central Asia during the post-Soviet years were, were, they were stagnant and they were revolutionarily charged, which aimed to spread political Shia Islam. Until Rafsanjani, the former president of Iran, um, became conscious of the fact that after 80 years of communist influence, the secular regimes of the Stans would no longer accept or tolerate political Islam in the newly formed states. His administration then shifted Iran's foreign policy from revolutionary to pragmatic. However, this did not gain much traction um, as Russian influence and growing Chinese involvement paired with the United States pressure to deter all significant developments concerning collaboration with Iran stalled the states from advancing from a meek ally to a strategic partner within the state. The JCPOA showed some promise with Iran um, coming out of economic isolation, but this was diminished as the Trump administration pulled out in 2018. Since then, however, there has been an increased relation between Iran and every single Stan. Um, there have been numerous bilateral and multilateral uh, diplomatic agreements taking place, as well as vast cooperation in several spheres. These activities range from economic transit expansion, such as the development of the Chabahar port and the China, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Iran where railway corridor, that's a mouthful, um, to art exhibits and business seminars within the state capitals. Um, from 2018 to now, major events have occurred between Iran and the Central Asian states. Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan have established or reestablished direct flights to Iran, um, some of them for the first time in 13 years. Um, Iran signed a free trade agreement with the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, President Rouhani attended the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia and the Shanghai Cooperation Summit organizations in Dushanbe and Bishkek. Um, the Foreign Affairs Minister of Iran, Mohammad Javad Zarif, completed a tour of the region um, in April. Um, I believe it ended April 11th. And Iran sent and received aid from every single Central Asian state with the exception of Kazakhstan during the COVID-19 pandemic. So clearly the reputational stigma of sanctions is not hindering the Central Asian states from cooperating any longer. And that brings us to the concept of sanction fatigue and the issues of credible commitment from the US. Iran was cooperating with the terms of the JCPOA before the Trump administration removed the US from the deal, which sparked international backlash from the majority of the world with the exception of known adversaries to Iran like Israel and Saudi Arabia. Then they hit Iran with the most sanctions the state has ever seen Iran is the most heavily sanctioned state by the United States, even more so than North Korea. Um, maximum pressure has attempted to completely shut down Iran's economy, specifically with the goal to bring oil exports to a zero. The US gave corporations around the world 90 to 180 days to wind down business in Iran, so they or they would be met with dip, uh, disciplinary action, such as targeted sanctions or being cut off from the American banking system. Initially, states like China, um, the European Union states, the UAE, Japan, or Japan, and India slowed down or stopped trade with Iran. But as of March, China received record amounts of Iranian crude oil. In 2019, the EU and Britain made a special purpose vehicle known as the Instrument for Supporting Trade Exchanges, INSTEX, to avoid US sanctions and retaliation. India, Italy, and Japan have all pledged to purchase oil as soon as sanctions are lifted, indicating that there is some hesitation still as these states are hoping for a renewed nuclear deal under the Biden administration. Should the deal not be reached, there is an increased likelihood of these states moving forward with Iran as they rely on their oil supply, as indicated by the Central Asian states and critical allies such as the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brooklyn. That was, uh, that was outstanding. Uh, Maggie, can I go ahead and uh, turn it over to you now? Yes, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, hi, my name is Maggie Mullen and today I will be going over how Iran and 
Hezbollah have gone through the usage of smart power and Iran has gained influence on the Mediterranean coast through Hezbollah by using smart power. Oops. Okay, so just some major events to get into this topic. In 1979, the Iranian revolution led to the overall ideal through Iran to spread Shia religion throughout the Middle East. And then in 1982, the Lebanese civil war um, is where the relationship between Iran and Hezbollah really sparked. Hezbollah was a Shiite uh, division within Lebanon and uh, Iran decided to help out in that case. And after that happened, Hezbollah's objectives have been primarily based on three principles, which are the belief in Islam, jurisdiction of the jurist theologian, and jihad. So the smart power that Hezbollah has used is through social services and politics. Hezbollah has veto power within the cabinet as an opposition party by promising not to use physical force within Lebanon to solve political problems. Well, this can kind of be seen as a hard power tactic because they're saying they're not gonna use physical force. However, they do use soft power to, to achieve political presence through um, social services funded by Iran as a form of Dawah as a way to spread Shiite values across the region. So getting more into the social services, uh, Hezbollah employs all of these social services. The Jihad al binyai Development Group is a reconstruction group responsible for addressing critical deficiencies within Shia regions, such as war damage, uh, you know, terrible infrastructure within the community. And they actually employ over a thousand civil engineers, construction people, uh, electricians, plumbers, and other specialists. So they're also helping out the economy by employing these people within this construction group. The next social service is the, um, the Islamic Health Organization. The Isla Islamic Health Organization was created in Iran after the Islamic Revolution in 1984, and they brought it over to Lebanon to assess the Lebanese, to help assist the Lebanese Shia and they are responsible for giving out medical aid, free medical services, including clinics, hospitals, evacuations, and helping out casualties. Within this Islam Islamic health organization, there are three groups, the Martyrs Foundation, the Wounded Foundation, and the Women's Association. I'm gonna to touch into the Women's Association the most because I think that is the most, uh, I think it's really cool and um, I don't have much time. <laughs> the Women's Association is part of the IHO and they, in the Middle East, women are usually not as um, cared for as in Western cultures. And in the Women's Association, if their husband or brother gets killed in warfare, then Hezbollah will help them out financially, medically. They really just take care of the women where they normally would, normally would be left um, just to fend for themselves. The next social service is the Imam al-Mahidi Scouts, which is a youth program that indoctrines the Hezbollah ideals within the youth through sports, um, shows, parades. They really target the youth, which is very pivotal because they are shaping the minds of the young people. Next is the education division, which is very interesting as well. Um, $14 million is you know, funded by Iran through Hezbollah towards the education division, and they provide free schooling for Hezbollah children, free hot lunch, um, transportation to school, and each education division, each school is indoctrined with the Hezbollah beliefs, and also, again, the young generation is learning the Hezbollah beliefs, and they're being shaped as well through the educational division. It is important to note that most of these organizations are surrogates and or branches of pre-existing Iranian organizations, and they're all funded through Iran. It is unknown how much money Iran actually gives Hezbollah for these social services. It has been quoted up to like 14 million. It's gotta be a lot of money to fund this many, this many social services. So that is a major soft power tool used by Iran through Hezbollah to gain influence on the Middle East and Mediterranean coast. I also researched propaganda media use as soft power. Propaganda media can be seen as a recruitment tool. And one of the most interesting ways it can be seen is by uh, influencing martyrdom within the community. As you can see, there's billboards of all of the martyrs and they're depicted in a heavenly sense with glowing backgrounds and they are really revered within the culture. 
in the media touches on the dream culture where martyrdom is one of the most highest ideals that Hezbollah fighters have. And the media has also been used for psychological warfare in their fight between Lebanon and Israel. Actually, um, one of their news sources has a broadcasting show where they will show all of the Israeli combatants that they killed and then at the very end they have a blank silhouette with a question mark saying who's next, like which Israeli um, soldier will be killed next and that really influenced the, uh, the winning of the war because it psychologically affected all of the Israelis. So I am a behavioral neuroscience major, so I wanted to look at this through psychology. Um, I kind of found a theory that I thought was really interesting that Edwin, Edwin Sutherland uh, came about and it's the differential association theory. And according to the theory, if an individual is a part of a group, they're more likely to do something that they may not have been able to do by themselves. Hezbollah has been able to convince people to fight by creating a mass group of people with like-minded interests through funding by Iran. And without Iran's help, they would not have been able to make such a large proxy in the Mediterranean coast without all these social services. So with that, does anyone have any questions? Thank, thank you very much, Maggie. We do have uh, actually a couple questions that I wanted to um, uh, address for, uh, and actually for everybody right now. Um, can you guys talk at all about uh, any of your language uh, studies that you've uh, participated in? I'm, I'm guessing maybe Brooklyn and Rachel, I'm not sure about the behavioral neuroscience, if that's something that will work out, but I'm interested. I can go first. Um, I transferred to KU from Louisville, Kentucky, and I took a year and a half of Arabic. I'm not proficient by any means, but I could read a couple words, so that's what I did is Arabic. Um, I can go next, Brooklyn. I'm uh, a junior currently, and I've been studying Russian since I got here at KU, so I'm in my third year currently. Um, so technically, I'm an advanced. Uh, we'll see how uh, fluent I actually am. And then um, I plan on um, starting Arabic just um, at the beginning in the fall, and I'm really excited for that. Excellent. Brooklyn? I am in intermediate Arabic as it stands with an emphasis on the Egyptian dialect. Um, and I am starting Persian in the fall. Outstanding. And Maggie, we had a, a question with respect to uh, the Hezbollah. Um, do you know which, uh, were you speaking about um, one faction, particularly the uh, faction in Iraq or uh, the Hezbollah in Lebanon? The Lebanese Hezbollah. Yeah. Um, most of my research was through Lebanon, uh, just because I focused on the Lebanese civil war. Very good. Well, I want to congratulate uh, you guys. Uh, you represented uh, yourself and uh, Rosdi very well. Um, you gave great presentations, and we had uh, you know you got in front, got in front of a lot of people today. So uh, well done, um, and for everybody, we'll be uh, picking up in uh, about seven minutes. Thank you.